Greetings once again in that name that is above every name, for the Bible declares that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. How blessed we are, how wonderful it is to be in the house of the Lord on this wonderful Wednesday evening as we endeavor to study God's word as we continue our journey in Revelation dealing with the seven churches of Asia Minor, which are the churches that represent every age up until today, today as of seven o'clock, amen. And we are just delighted and uh, excited about you joining us today, amen, and sharing in the word of the Lord. And, and as we will uh, notice in our study, uh, amen, it's going to be a whole lot of things that <clears throat> relate to us in our current day uh, situation and that it applies to the church and uh, bow with me for a moment of prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity and we thank you for the privilege of those who uh, are listening on the uh, social media. We thank you for those who are in person tonight and we just thank you for, amen, to everybody all over the place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. And uh, we welcome, we welcome uh, SMZ, we welcome Philadelphia and Vicinity, we welcome, amen, those who are across the country and around the world. Amen, amen. What a, what a blessing it is, amen. We are delighted to have with us tonight, who's sharing with us tonight. Welcome, Sister Brenda Mitchell. Welcome, Sister Tia Kennelly. Welcome, Brother Charles Farley. Amen. Welcome, our Georgia Connection. Welcome, Sister Betty Trimble, all the way from Statesboro, Georgia. Welcome, amen, Deacon Daniel J. Johnson, Sr. Delighted to have you. Welcome, Deacon Norman Haskins and Minister Wilhelmina Haskins. Welcome, Brother June Cole. Welcome, Sister Teresa Poole. Welcome, Sister Sharon R. Uter from the Vicinity and the Suburbs. Amen. Welcome, Reverend Varita Davis. Welcome, uh, online chairman all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. Uh, Deacon Charles Parker and wife Vicki Parker, delighted to have you on board this evening. Welcome. Sister Barbara Cherry is on board. Welcome. Minister Tiffany D. Curtis is on board. Welcome. Amen. Brother Deacon Vaughn Davis is on board. Welcome. Sister Katora C. Green and Deacon Derek Green, all the way from Newcastle, Delaware. Welcome. Sister Anita J. Green, welcome. Sister Susie Reed, another Georgia connection. Amen, all the way from Sylvania, Georgia, welcome. Sister Sheila Adams, welcome. Sister Gail Smalls, welcome. Sister Doris Mickens, welcome. Sister Nell Criswell, all the way from Glenside, Pennsylvania, welcome. Sister Bernetta Robinson Dorn, amen, all the way from Mount Airy, amen, welcome. Brother Charles Farley, welcome. Sister Laura Kennelly, welcome. Deacon Wilbur Moore, all the way from Newcastle, Delaware, welcome. Uh, Reverend Kevin Palmer, all the way from Claymont, Delaware, welcome. Sister Peggy Haley, welcome. Sister Sharon Bryant Jordan, all the way from West Oak Lane, welcome. Amen. Welcome, Sister Karen White. Good to see you, Sister Karen White. Welcome, Sister Diane Curtis. Delighted to have you on board. Welcome, Sister Pamela Garwood. Amen. And as somebody would say, Lottie Dottie and everybody. We are so delighted and excited, and we are always excited when the word when the word goes forth. Amen. Amen. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, God is good all the time. Amen. And if he's good all the time, 
I don't have to say all the time he's good. I'm just, you know, uh, a, a man using up a whole lot of energy when, uh, amen, when I say that. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. All right, let's, let's, let's get started. Let's get started. Revelation. Let's do a quick review. Let's do a quick review. A quick review. We're in chapter 2. Amen. Uh, chapter 2, we'll do a quick review. Remember uh, the first chapter? What is the main thing that we know, need to know about the first chapter? The main thing that we know about, need to know about the, sec, about the first chapter, there's two verses, verses 19 and verse 20. And verse 19 uh, gives us the key to unlocking the door to Revelation, right, the things that John had seen. That's chapter 1. What had he seen? Uh, that's starting at verse 13 through 17, and you can see what John had seen. He had seen the, the resurrected, risen Lord, and he, you know, he will describe him as one likened unto the Son of Man, but we're going to discover tonight who that image is in one word, in one phrase. Amen. And then chapter 20 gives us the mystery of the seven stars and, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels or the messengers or the pastors to the church. And the seven golden lampstands, they, are, they represent the churches themselves. And so that's what's going on in chapter 1. And then when we get to chapter 2, amen, we say that every church is introduced by a aspect or a character of that image that we saw in chapter 1. And so these things, he says, uh, he who holds the seven stars. And so you know who it is who's walking in the midst of the church. Amen. And uh, what we need to know about uh, the first church, uh, Ephesus, we need to know about, know that they had lost their passion for serving. They had lost their first love. That's what we need to know about, uh, about, about Ephesus. But, what, but then what we need to know about uh, uh, Smyrna, we, knew, we need to know that there was no condemnation to the church at Smyrna because they were the suffering church. And we should be encouraged that whenever we go through and whenever we are suffering, that there is an expiration date because God is still in control. He has not left his church over and turned his church over to nobody. And so God is still in control. And so we need to know about Smyrna that they're going to be in trouble, but it's a time limit. They should be in trouble for 10 days. There is an expiration date. And then last week, we, uh, we looked at, we looked at the compromising church. They had compromised the church at Pagamas. And Jesus says to that church, I know your works. I have a few things against you. And what did he have against that church? That they had adopted and embraced the doctrine of Baalism and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And we will see tonight how when apostasy and when the church began to fall, if the church is not checked and individuals and congregations are not checked, they will continue to go down, down, down. And we will see in, in the, the church tonight, the church at uh, Ra, the church at Thyatira, how they continue to fall to the apostate teachings, uh, false teachings of Baalism, because once you, once, once you start dealing with sin, it's hard to stop. And if you, don't, if you don't repent and catch yourself, you just get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in sin. And so that is what's happening to the church at Thyatira. And so Jesus says, and in verse 18, we're going to be looking at verse 18. I don't know whether we'll get 
through that tonight, but uh, the church at Thyatira has the longest letter. It has the longest letter and the most sternest rebuke. Uh, yeah, 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 that's what I said. That's what I said. I said, Simpson, uh, there was a strong threat to this church. Stronger than the rest. Yeah, the rest, he gave the promise and then the challenge, but he reversed it. And you will see the attitude of Jesus for the, next, for the next four churches, you will see his attitude change and it's more stern than it was before. Yeah, 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 let me see, let me see. Let me see if I can show it to you. Ah, usually he who overcomes, he leaves that to last, the promise. But he, you know, he, he, he used to say, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear, and then give you a promise. But in this one, he gives you the promise, and then the challenge on the end. He who has an ear, verse 29, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. And this pattern will be followed for the rest of the churches because he has a very stern rebuke to this church, and I wonder why. He says to the, church, to the angel of the church at Thyatira, these things says the Son of God. That's a change. Normally, it's the Son of, when you, when you go back to chapter 1 and verses 14, verse 14, he says, one likened unto the Son of Man, in verse 13, but now, without a doubt, he said, I'm the son of God. And he says that for a reason, because Thyatira was under Roman influence, and Caesar had made himself to be God. And that's what got John on the Isle of Patmos in the first place, because John was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God, and he refused to say Caesar is Lord. And so Jesus comes with no uncertainty about it. He says, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like flames of fire. In other words, I can see into the life of the church, not only only can I see into the life of the church, but I got eyes like flames of fire. I can burn right through all of the deception and look right into your heart. Don't fool yourself. Jesus has eyes like flames of fire that can peer right into your heart. And David understood that because David says in Psalm, in Psalm 139, he said, you know what I think even before I think it. And so God has eyes like flames of fire and feet, and his feet like fine brass. <clears throat> A sign of judgment. Judgment is coming to this church if they don't change. He says, ah, I know your works. Watch this now. I, I know your works and I know your love. I know your works, your love. And see, love always comes first. You remember Paul in that 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, though I have the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, love, love is manifested by all of your other works. That's how come, that's how come the church at, at Ephesus, they had lost their, they had lost their passion. They had lost their love, but he said, what I, what I like about you, Thyatira, and what I can encourage about you, and what I commend you for, you have not lost the passion. You know how you can do something, but you, you, you don't do it with no fire? You know how you, know how you, how you fell in love some time ago, and the fire is died down? 
and, 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 and you don't love me like you used to? Well, he says, I know your works. I know your love. You, I know you are serving out of love. And I know your faithfulness. Not only are you serving out of love, but you are faithfully serving. That's what I like about you, Thyatira. You are serving faithfully. And I know your, yeah, 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 I know your works. See, your works manifest your love. And if you don't believe it, tell me you love me, but don't come with something in your hand every now and then. <laughs> Y'all not going to talk to me, but I'm going to preach. You, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. In order to love somebody, you got to give up something. See, love is a, both a give and a take. And he says, I know your love. I know the passion that you have for serving, and I know you've served faithfully, but I also know your patience. Now, if you're reading another version other than the King James, it will probably say, I know your endurance, because patience equals endurance. James says, you are in need of, you are in need of patience, and when, 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 you, when you pray for patience, see, there's a whole lot of folk who are praying for patience. They want the patience of Job. You don't want the patience of Job because patience means endurance. And so you might have to go through what Job went through if you're praying for patience. Watch this. And let, let, let me give you a good definition for biblical patience. Biblical patience is defined in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 33, 36, I mean. First mistake I made all day. Hebrews 10, 36, that's the, uh, that, 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 if you ever you want to need, if ever you need a, a definition for patience or endurance, watch this. Now, the King James says, for you have need of patience. The NIV said, you are, patience is endurance. You have need of endurance <clears throat> so that after you have done something, you don't get patience by sitting around twirling your thumb. Y'all not going to talk to me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it anyway. I, I'm going to say it anyway. You don't get patience by, I'm sitting around, I'm waiting till something happens. I'm waiting till the Lord work it out. No, 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 no. You got to be doing something because the text says, for you are in need of patience and after ye have done the will of God, after you have done the will of God, then you will receive the promise. Thyatira, before they can see, or any other church, before they can receive the promise, they got to do something. You know, folk tell me all the time, you know, they see me, I'm pressing and pushing. Or you, oh, you just need some patience. Well, you don't know what patience is. You're, you are defining patience like the world defined patience, like God defined patience through endurance. Did y'all hear me? See, we have embraced the world. We have embraced, and, th and that's one of the reasons that, that Thyatira is corrupt because, and, and we didn't get to that yet, but, but they embraced a lot of the worldly stuff. And when you embrace the worldly stuff, you become corrupt. And you start taking on the world's definition. God's definition for patience is not sitting around waiting. Amen. I'll tell you about some stuff that I've been waiting for 15 years. I'm gonna reveal. I'm gonna reveal it in probably. Uh, I'm gonna reveal it in another month. So you need. You just need the. Uh, amen. Next next month I'm gonna reveal some stuff that I've been waiting on for 15 years. But I just. You know what? 
I just kept pushing and kept working and kept working at it and, it, and it finally happened. And so biblical patience is not sitting around waiting. Biblical patience is you got to do something. He says, I know your patience. Ah. And as far your works, the last are more than the first. In other words, in other words, your passion for serving the Lord has grown instead of diminishing. The church at Ephesus, their passion as it went long and as they began to serve, they lost their passion for serving. And how often it is, my brothers and my sisters today, folk have, folk have lost their passion for service. You know how you can tell that when, when folk have lost their passion for service? So they use words like the same old, same old. Child, I go to work and I come home, I go to sleep, I get up in the morning and I go to work again. Same old routine. You don't expect nothing new and nothing exciting. You are not expecting anything different to happen. It's the same old, same old. You've lost your passion. And since the word is inexhaustible, you should never lose your passion as long as you are in the word. As long as you're in the word, you ought to always have a passion. Because, you know, every time I study the word, I've went over these churches a man a hundred times. But, but this time, as I go over them again, I am excited because I am discovering something new. And, it, and it's even more relevant now than it used to be. I ain't looking for the same old, same old. I'm looking for something different. Y'all know, y'all know, like, y'all know how I like to put it. I like the K I S S. Keep it simple. Keep it short and simple. That's what I like. And so, let me see if I can make it simple for you. When, when, when I was in kindergarten, well, well, uh, Susie, we didn't have no kindergarten, but we had, we just went right to first grade, and. Uh, and uh, Brother Charles, we, we just, we started in first grade together. We, we didn't have no pre-primer and all that kindergarten like they, like they do now. We just started in first grade. And we learned some numbers. We learned numbers one, zero to nine. Yeah. And then when we got to third grade, you, you know, we learned how to multiply and divide using the same numbers, but we was getting different results. And then folk who were smart, like uh, Susie Reed, you know, she even took a class uh, and learned how to do fractions and algebra and all that stuff. But guess what? She still used the same numbers, but she was getting different results. And so every time I read this word, as I grow and get on another level, I discover something new. And that's the way, and that's the way you keep the fire going, and that's the way you keep the passion going. Yeah, he says, you've grown in love, and and because your love is manifested in your works. You ever seen folk come to church and they working? but they're complaining all at the same time. Ain't nothing right, but don't take that job away from them. They'll be upset, but yet they just going through the motion. Let's see what, let's see what, let's see further on. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allowed that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. 
Now, it probably was not a woman in the church who named Jezebel, but Jezebel is a type of character and spirit. And so Jesus was using her name symbolically <clears throat> because you see, you see the degradation starting in Pagamas with the doctrines of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Baalism from Moab, where Moabite, where Jezebel came from. And so Jezebel is a type of character and spirit. You can be a man and have a Jezebel spirit. Did y'all, I got, y'all, I gotta tell it like it is. I just can't, I just can't say that was a woman. But no, there is a Jezebel spirit and you can be a man and have a Jezebel spirit. And this was both spiritual adultery and physical adultery. You know the reason I know that? Go back to verse 14. When he says, I had a few things, a few things against you. Because you have embraced the doctrine of Baalism, ba 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 uh, of Balaam, who taught Balak to stumble before a stumbling block before the children of Israel to sacrifice idols and commit sexual immorality. The, uh, in Thyatira, influenced by paganism and idol gods, they had rituals of sexuality. You remember the, in the Old Testament, the sons of, the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, they, they were having sex right in the temple. It was a ritual. And so Jesus says, y'all got a Jezebel spirit, and he says that to expose her character. The word will expose your character. To teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Hmm. She taught the servants of God to abandon, to abandon their true exclusive loyalty to the Lord. She taught the servants of God to abandon their exclusive loyalty to the Lord. Thou shalt have no other God before me. But she taught them that it's all right. You know, there's some teachings going out these days. They're talking about, well, all you got to do is just believe, believe in something. No, no, you, it ain't just believe in something. No, you got to believe in God. <clears throat> and you know how folks try to get around not calling his name? It doesn't matter as long as you believe. No, no, you got to believe in the person of Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven where my men must be saved. You got to you got to believe in God. You know how folks, you know, we've been taught and we embrace the world's idea the man, and sometimes folk even pray the man upstairs. When I go home and go to bed, I'm the man upstairs. It could be any man. When you, I don't know who you're talking about when you talk about the man upstairs. He ain't the man upstairs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah. She was enticing the servants of God to abandon their loyalty to Jesus Christ. There was a popular talk show host not too long ago. She's no longer on the air. And, uh, and she looked like me. And she had a great following and a great influence. 
And she was telling folk that there are other ways to get to God other than Jesus Christ. She embraced what the, the world's idea, and, and see, that, that's what the world wants to hear, that I ain't got to go through Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> but, but verse 21 captures my attention because the text says, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. See, God did not threaten, use that strong threat in regard to sin. Good God Almighty. That, now, I like that. But her reluctance to repent. He wasn't condemning her for sin, but he condemns her because of her stubbornness and reluctant to repent. I'm glad you do. Look at this text. Somebody said, I see that. It's right here in the text. It's in your Bible. If you didn't tear it out, watch this. He says, look what God says. I gave her time to repent. Good God Almighty. Is it anybody who's listening to me tonight who need to repent what you're waiting on? I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not. Good God Almighty. Our safety from judgment is in repentance. Did y'all hear me? I said, my safety from judgment is in repentance. You hear me say all the time, I keep my prayer life up to date because I repent often. And God wipe this slate clean and let you start all over again. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, uh, let, let's, let, let, let's look at, uh, let's look at uh, Matthew 27, verse 3. Uh, give it to me from the KJV. Watch this now. And Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He repented within himself. He didn't repent to the Lord. I wonder what happened if Jesus, Judas had came to the Lord and repented. He repented within himself. Uh, now, you can go to, you, now you can go back to the uh, New King James. Uh, see, when you repent of yourself, within yourself. See, there's a whole lot of folk. Watch this. Watch me now. There's a whole lot of folk. They're sorry. They're not sorry for what they did. They're sorry they got caught. Yeah. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful. He was, re he was remorseful that he had condemned an innocent man. But he didn't repent. You can't be, ah, well, we'll see what happens when folk, when, when, when folk refuse to repent. But now, let's look at, look, let's look at 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel uh, ch chapter 12, verse 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. 
David is godly sorrowful. See, sometimes we, we might be sorrowful, but you got to be, when you repent, you got to be godly sorrowful. And, and I didn't give you that scripture, but uh, 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 Joseph, 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 when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and she said, well, my husband ain't going to find out. He's out on the battlefield. Joseph said, but I ain't worried about your husband. I cannot see this, do this sin against God. And so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, for the Lord also has put away your sins. You shall not die. <laughs> Good God. God always provides a way for us to uh, get back in relationship with him. And watch this. Uh, you can read it for yourself, but uh, I, I probably want to zero row in, in on the Psalm 51, verse 3. Psalm 51, verse 3. See, see, Psalms 51 tells the story of David and Bathsheba and David's sin with Bathsheba. Look what David says. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sins is always before you. And by the time we get to 10, time we get to verse 10, David says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I tell you, y'all, Jezebel is a type of spirit. It's, Jezebel is symbolic of a type of spirit. David says, create in me a clean heart, O God, because I am godly sorrowful for what I did and renew, uh, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Hey man, I said, our safety is wrapped up in repentance. Our safety from judgment is in our repentance. And we don't talk about that too much in church no more. Folks don't want to hear about repentance, but that's the only way that they can get back in relationship with God. Ah. I gave her space. Are you still breathing? Are you alive? Or did you wake up this morning? If you woke up this morning, God is saying to you that whatever you've done, and I don't care what it is, he says, I've given you space to repent. I will not let the sun go down, not let the not another minute go down before I repent. Because my safety from judgment, the way I escape judgment is through repentance. I gave her time. I gave her space to repent. I, how much time has the Lord given you? and you still stout-hearted, and you still are stubborn and reluctant to repent. Repent. He gave her, a th a, this church, a strong threat, not because of their sin, but because they refused to repent. See, we, Jesus never focused on the sin. He focused on the real problem that causes you to do the sin. And we focus on the sin. Well, why is it, why, why you think he died? He died for sin. I'm not going to walk around here and make like I ain't never done nothing and just because I'm, just because I'm in the pulpit, oh, I'm above y'all. No, no, no. He ain't called me because I was good. Y'all not going to hear me. Amen. He called me, Susie, Charles, all you folk, folk from Georgia. He called me because once he manifests his spirit in me, y'all will know without the shadow of a doubt that it ain't nobody but the Lord because I remember him when. And the same can be said for you. 
Folk can say, I remember you when, but no, do, you, do they know you now? Yeah. And it's hard for some folk to believe. You know, you know, you know but Charles, you, you know, we talk all the time, and, uh, and uh, y- y- you know, I said, uh, a whole lot of folk around here, they, they, they knew me as a boy, but they don't, mo- they don't know me as a man. They remember me when I was a boy. They don't remember me as a man who loves the Lord. Amen. Let me move on. Ah, verse 22, indeed, I will cast her into sick bed. Mm. I'm not sure the meaning of that, but I got an idea. It means hell. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. She had a following. She had a following, y'all. I said she had a following. He said, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the mind and the heart and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Now, I I, I told you Revelation, you know, chapter four on the 22 is is yet future, but uh, there's applications that you can make and principles that you can make. Let's, let's, can we go over to uh, uh, chapter six and verse, verse number eight? Watch this. This is when he opened the fourth seal. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and hell followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth part, a quarter part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger and death and by the beast of the earth. I wonder and I ponder if the Lord didn't release the deaf angel because we've embraced the doctrine of Jezebel and there is a following. Jezebel has a following. She has influence. Verse 24 says, now to you I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, small minority, there was a small minority that was not following the crowd. Now to you I say, and to the rest of thy tower, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan. And, and they say, I will put on As they say, I will put on you no other burden. There was a small minority There was a small minority who did not follow her. And what is his exhortation to them? What is his exaltation to this minority? He said, hold fast. Hold fast what you have till I come. Hang in there. Hold fast until I come. That small minority. Hmm. And he who overcomes 
and keeps my works till the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Power over the nations. Let's see. Power over the nations. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. And while he's getting that, power over the nation, he shall rule them with the rod of iron, and they shall dash to pieces like the potter's vessel. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.12. If you endure, watch this, endure to the end, he will also reign, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. But if we suffer with him, we're going to reign with him. In other words, we're going to rule along with Jesus Christ. Let's, let's, see, if, let's see if that's right. Let's go, to the new, let's go back to the Gospels, five, uh, John 5, 22. John 5, 22, I think. Watch this. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgments to the Son. And Jesus says to this church at Thyatira, to this small minority, that if you hold out until the end, and if you overcome, if you overcome, I'm gonna give you power over the nations, and you going to, you going to, you going to rule along with me. That's one of the rewards is ruling with him. Amen. If you hold out unto the end. Uh, they said, uh, as I also have received from my father, G God has put all things into Jesus' hand. He has put the power in his hand, the power of ruling into his hand. And Jesus says, if you overcome, you're going you to rule with me. And then what else? Finally, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. He addresses one church, but he addresses all churches at the same time. And so I told you earlier that in the beginning of this study that there was, there is an aspect of each one of these churches that's a part of your church. And he said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And uh, you know the outline, you know the outline you, you use for every church. There is a commendation. He commended them of their passionate love that manifests itself in deeds. Um, the church, uh, he, can, he, can, he, uh, he, yeah, he commend them, but he condemned them for embracing false teaching and false doctrine and embracing world, the world's doctrine. And then he counseled them by telling them to repent. And then he challenged them by he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. He challenged them as individuals. He who has an ear to hear, let him, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he gives you uh, the promise, the promise uh, to rule and, uh, yeah, yeah, to rule over the nations. That was the promise. And so the church at Thyatira, 
he challenged not only Thyatira, but he challenged every other church to listen to what the word saith unto the church. And next week, next week we wanna, we're gonna move to chapter three and we're gonna do verses three through, verses one through six, the church of Sardis. So next week we'll look at the church of Sardis. Amen, thank you for living. I mean, thank you for, thank you for living too. And thank you for living, for listening. Amen. Dean Simpson, are you coming to uh, close us out? Do you want? Huh? Are you, are you coming to close us out with an announcement? All right. And I'll go up and uh, I'll sign you off. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, what an exciting time. What an exciting time when, uh, when everybody is trying to diminish the church. Good evening, Second Mount Zion Church family. Uh, uh, it is great to be here on a Wednesday evening. We thank Reverend Moore for uh, that dissertation, breaking down the church at the entire Revelations, and we thank him for being in Revelations, and, and that, that book has always been one that people shied away from, but uh, there's no reason to shy away because it is the Word of God, so we're just grateful. Amen. Um, just one announcement that I want to make before we close out. Um, it's come to our attention um, that in the comment section, unfortunately, is a part of this cyber world that some folk will try to take advantage of the situation and there was someone who was in there who was solicitating um, some funds or making a solicitation and so um, after research that solicitation was not authentic um, so we have to be careful um, what we do so we ask that you would we just want to make that announcement so that you're careful that you don't give any money to someone that's a scam amen um, so we want to make you aware of that. Um, if you have any questions or if you see anything like that, uh, you can contact Second Mount Zion. And if there's uh, funds to be given out or if there's a true need, amen, and I think we talked about this in the Sunday school lesson last week, amen, if there is a true need, um, you can direct that to Second Mount Zion and we will certainly uh, do what is necessary to meet that, amen. So we don't want anyone to be taken advantage in this platform. Um, uh, uh, in this atmosphere. So we ask that you be cautious and um, any questions that you have, please direct them to the church. But that last comment that was in the comment, it was, it turned out to be not authentic. So we ask that you not patronize that. Amen. Amen. One final announcement. Oh, one final announcement and then we can, we can get closed out. Uh, I did make contact with the uh, with one of the families uh, of the nine persons who got burned up in the fire in North Philly a uh, week before last. And uh, I said that I was going, we was going to give it directly to a family that was in need and make sure that it got into their hands uh, to help them. And so I have made contact with the person who is, uh, I think the grandmother is a part of uh, Pastor Darian Brown's church. And uh, if you have any, if you, if you feel led to give, we're going to, we're going to give, uh, Second Mount Zion is going to give uh, directly to that family. So you can send your funds to uh, Second Mount Zion or pay, uh, put it on your tithing envelope or, you know, uh, there'll be a drop down box. You can put it in the uh, uh, section in the uh, uh, benevolent section in Easy Tide. Yeah. And that will be the missionary consecration uh, section. Uh, that's on your envelopes and that's in Easy Tides. Amen. Sunday school lesson so comes in handy. Amen. Um, all right, we thank you for your time. At this time, let us close out.
Our Father and our God, we thank you now for what ears have heard. We thank you now for the word that has brought forth. We thank you for the teaching that you have given us. We pray now, Lord, that these words, these teachings will be meat unto our soul, that they would, they would give us strength for the journey that you have set before us. We pray now, Lord, for all the bereaved families that are in Philadelphia. We pray for all those who are just feeling the anxiety of the time. We pray now, Lord, that you would calm fears, O oh Lord, that your word would be a comfort unto someone, O oh Lord. We pray now, Lord, that whatever it is that's going on for those who are out in the cyberspace that are joining us, that whatever the issue is, O oh Lord, that you can meet that need, that you have and you will. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we would give all our cares and concerns unto you, O oh Lord. We pray now that you would calm those fears and anxiety of these times, O oh Lord. And for all those who are struggling, whether it be with mental health, whether it be financial, O oh Lord, whether it be relationships, O oh Lord, that, Father, you would bring clarity to their situation, O oh Lord, that you would bring calm in the midst of a storm because we know that you are there even in the midst of the storm. So calm the, calm the hearts, O oh Lord, calm the anxiety, calm the fears. Give us calm right now, O oh Lord. We pray for our city, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, that the violence will stop, O oh Lord. We pray that we can be change agents. We pray for the family of the victims who were uh, who perished in the fire. We pray, O oh Lord, that through your strength, O oh Lord, that they will get through this time of need. We pray for all those who have fallen, who have went on, O oh Lord, that those who left behind can be strengthened, O oh Lord, to make a difference, to be change agents in this, in this age, O oh Lord. These and all the things we thank your son, we thank you, O oh Lord, in your son Christ Jesus. Let us say amen, amen, and amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord till we meet again. Amen.